morning, everyone. How lovely to see you again this Monday morning. So today we're going to be thinking about Stonehenge, which is the subject of a British Museum exhibition next summer. But we're also going to be thinking about Stonehenge within the context of the time at which it was most culturally important. And we're going to be looking at the lifestyles and the life ways of peoples in Britain at the time of Stonehenge. So I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint. I'm going to get my PowerPoint started. Uh, from the beginning as usual, always a good place to begin. I'm also going to pull up my little pointer. And there we are, there I go. Lovely. So welcome to our talk today, Stonehenge and life in prehistoric Britain. And we're going to start just with a quick table of information because there will be various terms you'll hear me use throughout the talk today. So just to give a bit of chronological context to the period we're talking about. Now, in essence, when we talk about prehistory in Britain, we are talking about a time where we are using objects as the main evidence, a time before there was written text. Spoken language, yes, but that language was not recorded using glyphs, pictures, or a script. So when we talk about prehistoric Britain, we're talking about everything before the arrival of the Romans, when Britain became part of the Roman Empire in AD 43. And these periods are not equal in length. So people often talk about the Stone Age, and when they say the Stone Age, what they are talking about in essence is the period in British history where stone was the main material for tool making. Stone, lithic, therefore we have the Paleolithic, which is the old Stone Age, the time when we have the first human beings arriving in the area of land that we now nowadays, nowadays know as the British Isles. We then have the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone Age, and this is a period of time which traditionally people refer to as a time when we have hunter-gatherer societies in Britain. It is also the time when Britain first becomes permanently settled. Before then, groups of people had been going to and fro from the area of land which is now Britain, which at that point had a land bridge to continental Europe and the human population in Britain during the Paleolithic is nomadic and comes and goes up to eight times over that period, usually in response to ice ages which make Britain uninhabitable. We then get to the Neolithic and that's one of the main periods we're going to be talking about today the New Stone Age, and that is the period of history where traditionally you will hear people talking about the introduction of farming to Britain. And we're going to have a little think about what we actually mean when we say the introduction of farming. We then get to the Bronze Age, the period of history where bronze becomes the main material used for tools. Just before the Bronze Age, archaeologists will also talk about a very short period, which isn't often shown on traditional timelines, known as the Copper Age. Copper is the metal that first begins to be worked, the knowledge of working metals coming from across Europe, starting in the Balkans and then arriving later in Britain, begins with working of copper then becomes as people start to develop alloys where they're mixing other metals such as tin and zinc with copper to make it harder and therefore more useful as a tool. This is the Bronze Age. We then have the last period of British history before the Romans, the Iron Age, where as I think you can probably already guess, um, iron becomes the main material used for tools. Um, of course, other materials continue to be used. So we still have bronze tools, we still have stone tools, but it's the point where iron working becomes part of 
people's lives and the economy in Britain. Uh, that's sometimes traditionally known as Celtic Britain. So you might hear people talking about Celtic Britain and they're usually referring to the Iron Age period of British history. Then we get to the point where there is the permanent occupation of Britain by the Romans. They visited several times before, um, but in AD 43, they actually um, invade landing on the south coast of Britain. And over a number of decades, Britain then becomes a fully fledged member of the Roman Empire, the province of Britain, which continues until AD 411. So we're going to be focusing today around this part of our timeline. So we're going to be doing a lot of thinking about what was happening in the Neolithic and in the Bronze Age in Britain. And we're also going to have a little peek backwards into the Mesolithic to give us a little bit of background to the development of Stonehenge. So Stonehenge itself as a built monument, as a built constructed part of the landscape, which includes not only the stone circle itself, which we are familiar with, but also includes the associated earthworks, the ditches, the banks, the manipulation of the landscape further afield, in terms of barrows, which emerged during the Bronze Age, and which we'll talk about later. So Stonehenge, the monument and the landscape in which it sat, was most culturally important between 4000 and 1000 BC. So 4000, the traditional date for the start of the Neolithic, so as farming becomes the dominant way of life in Britain, through to 1000, which is just towards the end of the Bronze Age. And the world of Stonehenge, was shaped by connections with the continent and saw some important transformations in European history, including, as we've already mentioned, the introduction of farming and metalwork and the development of long distance trade networks. So Stonehenge itself, the stone monument, was built in several stages during the transition from the Neolithic into the Bronze Age. And around 2500 BC in the Bronze Age, Stonehenge reached its final form and very few alterations were subsequently made to the monument while it remained an active part of prehistoric society. So what we look at today is what the monument would have looked like to the people from 2500 BC onward. As a prehistoric stone circle, Stonehenge is unique because of its artificially shaped Saracen stones, which are arranged in what is known as a post, those being the standing stones, and a lintel, the stones going across the top, formation. And because of the remote origin of its smaller blue stones, which come from 100 to 150 miles away in South Wales and travelled from South Wales to the site of Stonehenge in the current county of Wiltshire. And the name of the monument probably derives from the Saxon term Stanghenge, meaning quite literally stone, stang, and hanging or gallows, henge. Along with more than 350 nearby monuments and henges, including the complex at Avebury, Stonehenge was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1986. Now, interestingly, the modern archeological term henge is the back formation from the word Stonehenge. And it was first used in 1932 by an archeologist called Thomas Kendrick, who later became the keeper of British antiquities at the British Museum. And in essence, archeologists use the word henge to mean an ancient earthwork consisting of circular 
bank and ditch, which we can see here clearly on the diagram of Stonehenge, sometimes in association with a standing stone circle. And as we can see from this diagram of modern Stonehenge, the monument had an entrance point further marked with stones. And you can see here where they're marked up with the modern name, such as the Slaughter Stone, given its name because it was believed to uh, be a stone where sacrifices took place. Uh, this is extremely unlikely. It uh, would originally have been a standing stone, which later fell, which made it look like a sacrificial table. Um, and then once you came into the entrance of Stonehenge, you then have a set of holes which may well have held earlier posts, perhaps of organic material such as wood, and then the later incursion, so the later addition of barrows. And barrows are burial mounds dating from the Bronze Age. So the Stonehenge that we see today is not only the culmination of many hundreds of years of use of the landscape and manipulation of the landscape, but also the start of a longer journey into the Bronze Age, where the stones themselves may not have changed, but human activity and the human communities using them were changing. Stonehenge has long been a subject of historical speculation and it's been represented in drawings, paintings, and photographs. And the top drawing you see here is a reconstruction of Stonehenge drawn by the architect John Webb around 1650. It's drawn in brown ink with a title and a capital D, which presumably refers to an absent key. We have no further information on what else accompanied the drawing. The picture below it is a watercolour, which shows Stonehenge with many of the stones lying on the ground, two people sitting on a fallen stone below a stormy sky with, if we look to the left, a double rainbow. And this watercolour, using watercolour, graphite and black chalk, was created in 1836. So it gives us a snapshot of what the monument of Stonehenge looked like in mid-Victorian times. And it was created by the artist John Constable. A constable himself visited Stonehenge in July 1820 when he made a sketch, which was eventually worked up into a large finished watercolour which he exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1836. This watercolour represents a middle stage in the process. And if you look carefully, particularly on the side of the lighter side of the sky, you can see where it's marked up with squares ready to be transferred onto a larger sheet of paper to be worked up into the finished work, which is now held by the Victoria and Albert Museum. And Constable himself, captioned the picture, Stonehenge, the mysterious monument, standing remote on a bare and boundless heath, as much unconnected with the events of the past as it is with the uses of the present. It carries you back beyond all historic records into the obscurities of a totally unknown period. And John Constable's reflections on Stonehenge really indicate to us how the debate about what Stonehenge represented, how it had been used, began before John Constable and to many, to a great extent, actually continues today. So discussion about Stonehenge had begun in the 1600s with the antiquarian John Albury and continued into the 1700s with the archaeologist William Stukeley, both of whom believed that this, this structure was a Druid temple. However, as Stonehenge is now known to have predated by about 2000 years, 
the Druids, recorded by Julius Caesar, operating in Britain. This idea has been rejected. In 1963, the astronomer Gerald Hawkins proposed that Stonehenge was constructed as a computer to predict lunar and solar eclipses. And other scientists have also ascribed astronomical capabilities to the monument, although most of these speculations have been rejected. And in 1973, archaeologist Colin Renfrew suggested that Stonehenge sat at the centre of a confederation of Bronze Age chieftains. And in 1998, it was proposed that Stonehenge had been built as a monument to the ancestral dead. The permanence of its stones representing the eternal afterlife. Other archaeologists have since come to the view that this part of Salisbury Plain as a point of intersection between nearby prehistoric territories served in all likelihood as a seasonal gathering place for people living in the lowlands to the east and the west. Now, this does not negate some of the other suggestions around the use of the site as a memorial for the dead and um, the construction of the stones aligning with particular dates and times and actions in the skies. But it puts at the forefront of its role the permanent gathering place in a wide exposed landscape where people would gather together at specific times of the year to engage probably in social, religious and economic activities. The Stonehenge visible today is incomplete. Many of the original stones have been broken up and taken away, probably during Roman and medieval times, and the ground around the monument has been severely disturbed, not only by the removal of stones, but also by digging, which dates back to the 1500s. And one of my favourite excavations at Stonehenge dates to 1877, when Charles Darwin dug two holes inside the circle at Stonehenge to investigate the earth moving capabilities of earthworms. Uh, and I, I rather like the thought that you could have a, a really left field idea that Stonehenge had been created by earth moved underneath by earthworms there. One of my other favorite explanations is that uh, it's an alien docking station and rather as the pins you have on a plug go into a socket, so the stones would have docked into the bottom of a spaceship. The first, what we would say to our minds, proper modern archaeological excavation was conducted in 1901, and about half of Stonehenge, mostly on the eastern side, has been excavated by archaeologists between 1919 and 1978. And the results of this work, this very long-term excavation, were not fully published till 1995, when the chronology of Stonehenge was revised extensively by the means of carbon-14 dating, dating on objects recovered from the ground around and within the Stonehenge circle. And major investigations again in the early 2000s led to further revisions of the context and sequence of Stonehenge. So this is why I say the debate around what Stonehenge is and how it was built, why it was built, how it was used is a continuing debate. New ideas and new hypotheses are continually being raised and the object, the uh, monument is being reinterpreted continually. And one of those reinterpretations will be in the exhibition next summer. And that will be an opportunity for the Bronze Age curator at the British Museum, Neil Wilkins, to bring together the thoughts of himself and some of his museum colleagues who specialise in this particular period of European history to think about what, what they think Stonehenge represents and how we nowadays should understand it. The idea of gatherings, the idea of Stonehenge being a place where disparate groups uh, in a Britain with at that time a tiny population 
uh, could come together and meet and mix and mingle is backed up by objects that have been found in other prehistoric settings of the time. This is a copper alloy musical instrument, dates to around 1000 BC, uh, and it actually comes from Ireland. And it would have been played either individually or together with other trumpets of this sort to produce a variety of different notes, sounds and tones. And I think that's one of the things that we need to think about when we're looking at a prehistoric monument such as Stonehenge is just not what you would have seen when you stood there, which is why there is a lot of emphasis on reconstruction drawings and diagrams and mapping the landscape to show how people move to and from it, but also to think about what you would have heard when you were there and to some extent what you might have smelt when you were there, particularly if there was some form of feasting or bonfires being lit as part of these gatherings. Now this particular trumpet would have been played using the mouth hole, which is near the capped end of the horn, and it's part of a range of created musical sounds from this period, which would also have drawn in sounds made by wooden pipes, bone whistles and percussion instruments. And monuments like Stonehenge, with their opportunity for gathering, enable people to come together for social, spiritual and communal enterprises. And in particular, the first prehistoric monuments such as Stonehenge provided places for the new farming population to gather, stockade, trade and exchange domesticated animals. They could also become part of a burial landscape and at Stonehenge, cremation burials have been excavated while the monument itself now sits within a wider landscape of Bronze Age burial mounds. The archaeologist Tim Deville has identified around 670 burial burial barrows in the Stonehenge landscape, the most populated area in Britain in terms of burial monuments. And to create such a landscape, not only the henge itself, but all the barrows around it, requires a huge amount of human labour and also a high level of social organisation that can bring usually disparate separate groups together for a communal activity. Near Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain, there is another Neolithic site, Woodhenge. Woodhenge was probably built around 2500, which is around the time when we think that the final form of Stonehenge was achieved by the human communities at that time. And Woodhenge is formed of six concentric oval, ovals of standing posts, and here you can see them in this aerial photograph, marked out with modern concrete posts. And then the whole henge was surrounded by a bank and ditch. The site itself was discovered by aerial photography in 1925, when rings of dark dots were spotted in a crop of wheat. And anyone who was with us for the earlier talk where we examined the whole role of crop marks in discovering archaeological sites will be aware that the posts where the wooden posts had rotted away left a deep pit in the soil, which enabled the crop growing over that pit to have a longer root run and therefore stand proud as what almost you could say wheat dots, which could be seen from above. And today, concrete markers mark the position of these timber posts. The whole Henge Monument is about 90 metres across and has a single entrance, which we can see here on the aerial photograph, to the northeast. Now, this entrance faced towards a site known as Drewington Walls, a large enclosure 70 metres away where there was another timber structure and a Neolithic settlement. And when Woodhenge was first excavated, many other objects were found, including pottery, 
carved chalk objects, antler picks, animal bones, flint tools, fragments of human bone, and at least one human cremation. So demonstrating that this was a very busy site in terms of a range of human activities in and around the Henge itself. And excavations in 1967 across the ditch, which ran around the Henge, uncovered a pile of 10 antler picks left behind by the people who had originally dug the ditch. At Stonehenge, in contrast, few objects were left behind and the monument site seems to have been kept clean by the communities using it. It seems that different forms of rituals and placements of objects were taking place at Woodhenge, perhaps with people processing or moving around the monument in prescribed ways. And the oval posts at Woodhenge are aligned northeast, the entrance, to southwest, which is the same alignment that you have at Stonehenge. The horizon towards the southeast, the direction of the midwinter sunset, rises to block any view of the actual sunset. So from Stonehenge, you cannot see the horizon, but to the northeast, Looking the other way, there is a clearer view. So it seems likely that the monument was built to align with the midsummer sunrise. Another timber monument nearby at Drewington Walls was aligned to the midwinter sunrise. So perhaps these monuments were intended to be used for similar purposes at different times of the year with people processing from this site to Stonehenge. The next henge we're going to look at takes us away from the Salisbury Plains. And if I can pick up the moving on button, perfect. We have a photograph of a more recently discovered henge, Sea Henge. And Seahenge is a prehistoric monument in Norfolk. And Seahenge is a ring of timber posts with an upturned tree root in the center. And it was probably built during the early Bronze Age. And current theory is that similarly to Stonehenge and Woodhenge, it had a mainly ritual function. The structure had been common knowledge amongst locals for several decades before it's received its name from the press in 1998 during excavation publicity and was named after the press, was named by the press after Stonehenge. The people constructing Seahenge used bronze axes to shape the timber and 3D imaging of the individual timbers allowed archaeologists to measure the exact axe curvature and width of each blade that was being used to make a cut in the timber. And this revealed that 59 different blades had been used in the construction of the monument. The trees used in the construction of the monument had all been felled based on scientific analysis of tree rings in the timbers in the year 2049 BC. And this scientific confirmation that all the trees had been felled at the same time suggests that the building of Seahenge was a single event. There was a great amount of work involved in felling, transporting, preparing and erecting the timbers so it is likely that it was done by a large number of people working together. And the, the way that archaeologists talk about these sites being sites of ritual activity is also an interesting indication for us that when we look at these sites within the context of the 
wider societies who are creating them, we are looking at a settled human population who are not moving through the landscape in a way they once were, but now with a settled site where they live and they farm and afford to put time into building fixed points within that landscape that they can move to and from and around. And also I think it's very interesting that when we look at Woodhenge and Seahenge, when you first look at them, they seem less impressive than Stonehenge. They're built from wood. To our modern mind, that suggests something uh, more primitive than a group of people who are building with huge Saracen stones. But I think what is interesting about Seahenge in particular is that analysis of the tools that we use to make it. So we, we shouldn't be thinking about what is the monument made from, but we should be thinking about how was the monument made. And what I think is key to probably both Woodhenge and Seahenge is the fact that they were built when bronze started to be used as a tooling material. And it is that use of bronze to create axes, which is being demonstrated the skill needed to create the shaped timbers with those bronze axes that gives both Woodhenge and Seahenge part of its ritual meaning. So not only is it a specific part of the landscape that has been chosen away from land that would have been used for agricultural purposes, so it sits outside the wider farming context of these new settlements, but also it's drawing on the use of a brand new technology, something that has just arrived, something that has recently become part of people's worlds at this time. And using these tools is then part of the value, the added value that the humans are ascribing to the timber material being used to create it. From our point of view, of course, wood is a wonderful material in a waterlogged situation. And the fact that the shoreline moved over the subsequent thousands of years between the construction and the rediscovery of the site means that it sat in a completely immersed waterlogged environment for the majority of its life, which has enabled the survival of this extremely unusual, rare and beautiful wooden hedge. We're now going to take a 10 minute break, after which we are going to return to Stonehenge itself and we're going to start looking at some of the aspects of human life which were developing and becoming fully embedded in the communities who constructed and used the site at Stonehenge. Thank you very much. See you in 10 minutes. Hello and welcome back to part two of our talk on Stonehenge and prehistoric Britain. And what we're going to be doing in the second part of our talk today is having a look at some of the innovations and changes and indeed transformations that were occurring in Britain at the same time as Stonehenge was at its most important. So we're looking at the Neolithic into the early Bronze Age period of British history. We'll be looking at some objects quite closely associated with Stonehenge and the Salisbury Plains and other objects we're going to draw from the British Museum collection from other parts of Britain, which help us to understand specific aspects of life at this time. And we're beginning with some objects from a Mesolithic site, Mesolithic being the period immediately before the Neolithic uh, and in old money. The Mesolithic was often referred to as the time when people were living, living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle before the introduction of farming, the early farmers, which we refer to as the Neolithic period. So this Mesolithic site is known as Starkar and it's in Yorkshire and it is the site where a group of people lived at the northern edge 
of a now filled in lake, the former Lake Flixton. And these Mesolithic people lived by the lake for around 600 years from about 9,200 to 8,600 BC. And they were amongst the earliest people to resettle Britain after the end of the last ice age. And they were living by hunting and gathering animals and plants in the forest that covered most of Mesolithic Britain. And what we have here on the screen are two sets of artifacts recovered from the site. The one at the top is a worked red deer antler frontlet. It's made from the skull, a large stag, and lines of cut marks made by flint tools show where the skin was removed from the skull to expose the bone below. And the bones forming the top part of the nose were broken off and the edges of the remaining skull partly trimmed. The rim of the skull has been smoothed and interior projections cut and scraped smooth. The antlers were also broken off and the stumps themselves thinned down. You can see here where that thinning has exposed the internal structure of the antlers. Thinned down and trimmed around the base. There are two holes at the back of the skull, which were made by cutting and scraping away bone from both sides. So making holes from both sides till it met in the middle. And these holes were probably used to tie the modified skull onto a human head. It's been suggested that the antler frontlets were used as a hunting disguise or in some form of ritual practice. Recent work suggests that these, along with other objects made from red deer antler, were respectfully deposited at the lake edge due to the spiritual significance of red deer, one of the primary food sources for the people who occupied the site. And then down to the bottom, on the right of the screen, we have two small objects, which if you were to hold them in your hand, reach about the size of a human thumb. And they are birch bark, which has been stripped from the outside of a young birch tree and then tightly wound in a roll. It's a convenient way to store birch bark, which could have had various uses. The rolls themselves may have been used as net floats, floats, or the bark may have been used to make containers or as a source of resin. And there's also a suggestion that tightly wound and dried bark such as this would have operated as a form of fire lighter when fires were being lit in the area. Now, the introduction of farming around 4000 BC changed people's attitudes to the natural world. It required the clearance of woodlands to make way for crops and animals and the construction of routeways through the landscape. The process of this transformation to a farming way of life was not straightforward and it required the reshaping of people's cultural lives. And there's evidence of both change and continuity from pre-farming lifestyles. So despite the wish for archaeologists and historians to create tight borders between different historical periods, in real life there was more of an ebb and flow to people's individual lives as the Mesolithic way of life declined and farming became the dominant way of sustaining life and organising society in Britain. And we have in the British Museum collections evidence of some of the objects that start to emerge as farming arrives and becomes a way of life in Britain. And what we have to the left 
is a flint sickle dating to around 2500 BC and it was found near the modern town of Eastbourne. One edge is curved, the other relatively straight. And one end is thicker than the other and the whole implement is thicker in the center. Now, this sickle would have been handheld and the straight edge would have been worked to create a cutting edge used to cut through the stems of farmed plants. And one of the ways that archaeologists are able to determine whether particular flint tools have used, been used in conjunction with meat or with vegetable food sources is by a phenomenon known as sickle gloss. And this is a residue found on the blades of sickles and scythes which suggests they've been used to cut the silica rich stems of cereals and they therefore form indirect proof of early agriculture. The gloss develops from the abrasive action of silica in both wild and cultivated stems of cereal grasses which means that a reaping tool such as this does not necessarily imply cultivation of domestic crops, but certainly suggests that humans are using wild versions of these domesticated crops, probably during the Mesolithic period, before the move to settled farming of the domesticated versions of the same wild, uh, wild crops. On the other side, we have a copper alloy reaping hook. You can see the hook here at the top with a wooden handle made from field marble. And the hook itself has a curled down terminal. And we can see here the cutting inside edge which is where the striking of this sickle through the stems of the crop would have cut crops, enabling them to be taken from the field to the settlement for further processing. And this particular sickle was found in 1995 in Shinewater Marsh, East Sussex, where it had been preserved in the wet fen-like landscape. And I've popped in just below a photograph of the object when it was first excavated. It was block excavated, which means it was lifted out of the ground within a surrounding matrix of the soil in which it had sat for the previous 2000 years. And this was then excavated scientifically by scientific conservators in a museum laboratory. And what was revealed was this sickle, which was given by Eastbourne Museum, who originally were responsible for its excavation and conservation, given by Eastbourne Museum to the British Museum, where it now lives. The implement was found near the remains of a late Bronze Age platform, which was uncovered during modern work to dig a lake to alleviate potential flooding in the area. There's a small hole in the handle, about two and a half centimeters below where the handle joins onto the metal socket. And the hole appears to have been deliberately made because it's got a slightly square section to it. If it was purposely made, a rope could have been put through it to enable the owner to carry the sickle on a blade. But there still remains the option that the hole was the result of animal activity during burial and not deliberate human act. And sickles such as these made initially from stone and then in the Bronze Age using the new material bronze or creating farming tools were used to cut crops such 
as the early wheats and barley being grown in Neolithic Britain. And here we've got a photograph of one of the earliest wheats to arrive in Britain. This is known as Emma wheat. And together with barley, it was one of the most important cereal species. It was one of the first crops domesticated in the Near East, collected from the wild and eaten by hunter-gatherers for thousands of years before it was domesticated, which is why when we were talking about sickle gloss, we can't rule out the fact that flint implements may have been used by hunter-gatherers as, as, as part of the harvesting of wild food sources, as well as these sickles being used by the early farmers harvesting from cultivated field areas. And domesticated wheat differs from wild wheat in that it has non-shattering spikes, which means the plant retains more seeds and is easier to harvest. So in a natural context, once these seeds or wheat berries have fully ripened, the plant would want to distribute its seeds as far as it possibly could. So therefore having an unstable ear, which meant that this head literally shattered and the seeds were scattered over a wide area, meant for su successful propagation by the wild species. From a human point of view, you would want a crop which once the seeds had ripened remained on a stable ear which could then be cut and carried to the settlement for processing without the loss of individual wheat berries falling off. And here we see the individual wheat berries which the Neolithic farmers would have been gathering and these berries were then processed on stone quorns. And stone quorns were a stone tool first used in the Neolithic period to grind cereal into flour. Now prior to this, grain had been removed from its husk by a pounding method, simply spreading the grain on a stone surface and crushing it with a handheld stone. Now this particular stone quern was found on the Isle of Anglesey. It's broken, we can see part of one corner is missing, and it's known as a saddle quern, quite simply because of its shape. If you look at it, it's like an upside down saddle. So it's known as a saddle quern, and it comes with a top rubbing stone. And both are made from a coarse grained, hard igneous rock. The lower stationary stone would have been placed on the ground. Grain would have then been spread on the upper surface. And the upper smaller stone, sometimes known as a muller, a rubber, or a hand stone, was then moved in a back and forth motion across the saddle quern. Later querns, are known as rotary querns, and this is the top stone at the bottom of the slide from an Iron Age rotary quern found in Yorkshire. And here, the central hole of a rotary quern is called the eye, and a handle would be inserted, slotted into the top stone, and this top stone would then be rotated rubbing on the stationary lower stone to grind the wheat berries. Now the type of stone, the best type of stone from which to manufacture quern stones is an igneous rock. These have naturally rough surfaces but are stable. So the material being ground doesn't become gritty. In 1994, archeologist Dr. Waylin Samuel took just under two hours to grind 1.2 kilograms of emmerwit into a fine flour on a replica saddle quern. And based on her experimental work, she suggested that an experienced Neolithic miller would probably take about half an hour 
to perform the same task of transforming 1.2 kilograms of wheat berries into a fine usable flour which could then be mixed with other substances to create wheat, or as we would probably call them nowadays, breaded products. The development of settled parts of the landscape and the development of farming, which necessitated people to remain near their animals and their crops for the vast majority of the year, to not only plant, but then to maintain and finally harvest the plant crops, meant that there was a development of routeways across the landscape. And what we are looking at here is a museum reconstruction of one of these routeways, which is known as the Sweet Track, named after its finder, Ray Sweet. It was a raised walkway in the Somerset levels that ran across a reed swamp for just over a mile between an island in the marshy land to some higher ground to the south. And the track itself is made from three components. It has oak, ash and lime planks. You see a plank there at the bottom. And also rails and pegs. These pegs being made mainly from ash and alder. And the tree ring evidence shows that it was built in 3807 BC and that it was repaired and maintained at least until 3800. So it, it was in use for about eight to 10 years. And the trackway was one of a network that once crossed the Somerset levels. The community that constructed it were Neolithic farmers who'd settled in the area around 3,900. And before this, the uplands surrounding the Somerset levels were heavily wooded. The people began to clear the forest to make way for a settled life that was predominantly pastoral with a small amount of cultivation. During the winter, the flooded areas of the Somerset Levels provided fish and wildfowl. And in the summer, drier areas provided open grassland for grazing domesticated cattle and sheep, plus the opportunity to hunt and gather wild animals, birds, fruits and seeds. And the need to reach islands in this marshland was obviously sufficiently pressing for these communities to engage in the task of sourcing, working, and then building with these timbers the trackway. And this work was probably undertaken when they were, the waters were at their lowest period after a dry period. And the track itself demonstrates their woodworking skills. And indeed the surrounding woodland appears to have been managed so the areas that had not been cleared for farming were being managed for timber for at least 120 years before the track was constructed. Now the separate parts of the trackway were prepared on dry land before being taken to the wet area. And here we can see a drawing of a cross section of the reconstructed track and how archeologists think it was built. And then down below, we have again another modern reconstruction, this time in situ in an area of the Somerset levels. Now the rails were laid end to end. Here we see one of the base layers, one of the base rails resting on the firmer layer of peat underneath what would later become the water surface of the wetlands once the rainy period, the winter and autumn period, had converted the area into marshland on a seasonal basis. And this rain was secured by sharpened, this rail was secured by sharpened pegs driven at an angle into the ground on either side. So actually the, the rail is caught beneath the cross shape from the two large pegs driven into the ground.
The planks were then wedged into place between the pegs, parallel to the rails beneath, and held in place by these smaller, thinner vertical pegs, which simply go straight down into the underlying clay to hold the plank in place. The track was used for less than 10 years before being abandoned, probably due to rising water levels in the area. Following its discovery in 1970, most of the track was left in its original location with conservation measures, including a water pumping and distribution system to keep the water wet, keep the wood wet. Some of the track is stored at the British Museum and other pieces are stored at the Museum of Somerset in Taunton. And in 1973, a jade-eyed ax head was found alongside the track. And it's thought to have been placed there as an offering. It's one of over 100 similar axe heads found in Britain and Ireland, and its good condition and precious material suggests it was a symbolic axe rather than a functional tool used to cut wood. And here we can see it where it was discovered by archaeologists in 1973, where it presumably was dropped deliberately by someone walking along the track and fell through the water to rest on the peat at the bottom of the marsh. And the stone from which this axe is made came from the North Italian Alps and the axe could have originally functioned as some form of currency or been the product of gift exchange. Radiocarbon dating of the peat in which it was found suggests that it was deposited about 3,200 BC. Other wooden artifacts found in the region include paddles, a dish, arrow shafts, part of four hazel bows, U-pins, digging sticks, a comb and a spoon fragment, demonstrating the ubiquity of local wood as a material for making everyday objects. And the fact that in a flooded, waterlogged environment, these materials, which rarely appear in museum displays, survive, whilst others deposited in drier parts um, have since decayed and no record of them has survived. Finds from other materials, such as blint flakes, and flint arrowheads have also been found. And next to our Somerset axe, we have a jade-eyed axe, which you can see on display at the British Museum, also made from stone sourced in the Italian Alps. And this one was deposited in Kent, probably around four to 2000 BC. It's highly polished and it would have taken hours to make. It's completely unmarked and therefore assumed never to have been used for cutting wood. Again, it's probably a luxury status symbol indicating its owner's power and prestige and was probably traded through Brittany in France and arrived in England as an object of ceremonial ritual. And Julian Vandel, the former curator of this object at the British Museum, points out that the jade-eyed from which it is made in Britain is rare and also incredibly beautiful. And when polished, it has a grain that is aesthetically very attractive. The color grain, the color green may also have had a resonance at the time. And the mountains from which the stones came were perhaps thought of as spiritual and the journey to reach them was probably an important part of the whole process and part of the value added element of the object, which took it beyond the functional stone axes that people at the time would have used in everyday life to an axe in which it is imbued with the value not only of the material from which it is made, 
but its rarity, its beauty, and the time it would have taken to make it, and indeed the time it would have taken to source the material and then trade it from Italy back through France to Britain. And about 160 jadeid axes like this have been found in the British Isles. Now, we mentioned previously that another stone key to prehistoric British life is the flint. And alongside prestigious stones, such as the jadeite axes, archaeologists have found huge quantities of prehistoric flint work, such as this leaf-shaped arrowhead. And flint was vital for prehistoric societies. It's one of the most durable rocks available. When worked, it is sharper, than a metal razor blade, and it is second only to diamond in terms of hardness. And perhaps most importantly, when flint is struck, it fractures to leave a broken surface, the shape of which is controlled by the person striking it and not by any inherent orientation within the flint. The knowledge that a lump of flint would break and fracture in a certain way when it was struck meant it could be predictably worked to produce tools of defined shapes and types. After the introduction of metal, flint continued as an important source of building and tool manufacture for the next 2000 years and indeed continued into modern times with the use of small pieces of work flint in flintlock pistols. The next piece of flint is a Neolithic or Bronze Age flint point and this one was found near Stonehenge in an area of the landscape known as the Old King's Barrows and what I particularly like about this is that you'll know that one of the themes we've been picking up on is the idea of the life of an object once it arrives in a museum. And here you can see the top side of the worked flint with the point. And then on the underside, we have the markings that were placed upon it when it was found in Victorian times in Wiltshire. And the BM registry for this object refers to the Old King Barrow Stonehenge. And we can see that written on the flint in ink. It also says number four, which they think may suggest the fourth month, may have been found in April, and then the year 1866, which we can just see here, 1866, and it was a casual find. You can just make out the word casual in brackets, which means that it was probably found lying on the surface rather than through excavation. And the object number for this flint point, it was found in 1866, but the object number begins 1873. So we know that it didn't arrive at the British Museum until 1873. Here we see its museum number with the 73. And then it was registered on the 19th of the 12th month, December. And it was the 35th object to be registered that day by that department. And the text on its surface has now become part of the history of the object since its discoveries, its discovery in the 1900s. Another key material for the Neolithic is pottery. And we see here two pottery beakers. The one on the left found at Winterstoke, Wiltshire, found buried in an oval burial barrel. And the second one found from Yorkshire, again found in a burial barrel, dating to the Neolithic or Bronze Age. And beakers was one of the most well-known forms of prehistoric pot in Britain. And given the unusual form, or we could say distinctive form of beaker, pottery and its abrupt appearance in the archaeological record around 2500 BC, 
the what it is known as beaker culture is a possible explanation for the introduction the arrival of farming in Britain and it has been said that the beaker package which includes these beaker pots and the introduction of domesticated crops and animals helps to explain the arrival of farming and one explanation is that a group of people already skilled in early farming moved across Europe to Britain bringing these objects and knowledge with them. Alternatively there is a theory known rather delightfully as pots not people which suggests that this package of knowledge which included religious beliefs, how to work metals, how to farm the landscape, arrived as a package of information which was passed between communities and adopted by the resident people with little migration from Europe. And this new knowledge combined with a Mesolithic way of life already established in Britain, then developed into the fully fledged Neolithic farming communities of Britain. And it's also been suggested that the beakers were designed for the consumption of alcohol and the introduction of this substance to Europe from the Near East may have helped to fuel the beakers spread. Some other beakers have been found to be used as containers for reducing copper ores, so smelting containers, and others have organic residue inside associated with food, whilst others were employed as funerary urns. Now, what we're looking at here is to the left, a beautifully reconstructed beaker where the individual pieces found in the burial mound have been put back together again to show us what the original pot looked like. Pottery is one of the mainstays of archaeology, but although it is well preserved, it is most commonly found like this. Prehistoric pottery was hand constructed using techniques such as pinching, slab building, ring building and coil building and the worked clay was then air dried and open fired in bonfires and these pots were then used for cooking, storing and serving food and they were also an avenue in terms of their decoration and their shape for artistic expression and pottery indicates that the people using that pottery were most probably sedentary because nomadic people would not have wanted to carry heavy breakable pots and probably use lightweight portable skin bags or woven containers made from tree bark or reeds for transporting foodstuffs and liquids. This is a set of 61 wall sherds and three rim sherds, sherd being the archaeological name for a small piece of broken pottery, which came from a Ministry of Works excavation at Stonehenge in 1932. And the pieces were recovered and then donated to the British Museum. And there have, they have, you can see here, their museum number, 1932, the date of their deposit at the museum. And then each of these individual pieces will have its own individual number. And to finish our talk by having a quick look at Stonehenge today. So today Stonehenge is managed by English Heritage. When the site was first opened to the public, it was possible to walk amongst the stones, but the stones were roped off in 1977 as a, as a result of serious erosion. And visitors are no longer permitted to touch the stones, but are able to walk around the monument 
and you can see here people walking on the path laid out by English heritage a short distance away from the monument. Local residents are still entitled to free admission to Stonehenge because of an agreement concerning the movement of a right of way when the site came into the management of the government. As traffic increased, the setting of the monument was affected by the nearby A344 and the A303, the 303 being this road we can see in the lower photograph. And plans to cut a tunnel for the A303 have been very controversial and plans to do so were cancelled in 2007 and debate about the best way to create a traffic bypass for this section of the A303 continue today. Meanwhile, the other road, the road which we see in the top photo, which went up the side of Stonehenge, was closed in 2013. The section of tarmac was removed and replaced with grass and a new visitor centre was opened to the west. The old car park was removed and the old visitor centre, which was built below ground level, which linked the car park. If you look very carefully in this photo, you can just see where a bit like a, a subway in a modern town, the underground area, the entrance comes out, to bring you onto the path that goes around Stonehenge, all of that was filled in with concrete as part of the project. So uh, I, I went to that old, as a small child, went to that old entrance area where indeed you went down under the ground so that it couldn't be seen. It was a part of the skyline when you were standing at Stonehenge. They had a cafe, they had a little shop and the ticket booth. Uh, I often like to think that in thousands of years time, archaeologists of the future will do some digging around Stonehenge and they'll say we found this fascinating um, odd shaped concrete block uh, and we're not quite sure what it is um, but it probably had a ritual purpose. So the story of Stonehenge, Stonehenge is ongoing and uh, its interpretation is likely to continue for I dare say hundreds of years. So thank you very much indeed for joining me today. And we are now into our question and answer section. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, right. So the first question for Catherine is, uh, does Stonehenge or any nearby Henge have any water lines nearby that's not rivers? Oh, very interesting question, because one of the things that exercises the minds of archaeologists trying to interpret Stonehenge is the fact that it is built on high land, but also very dry land. It's built on chalkland, what is nowadays known as the Marlborough Downs in Wiltshire. And chalk is a material that drains water very easily. So there are a number of waterways that run through Wiltshire. It's not a completely dry county. But in terms of where Stonehenge and Woodhenge and Avery are situated, they're on a higher part of the chalk downland where rain more naturally drains very quickly away from the surface, which means that archaeologists ask themselves, was this landscape chosen not just because it's very high and visible, but because it was a type of landscape which was not immediately part of the farming environment that these communities were developing. Therefore, it was very different. It was very other to the cleared areas of forest where you would need water sources for growing your crops and watering your animals. And we know that a lot of early settlements are near lake or river sites, as we saw with Star Car. So the dry nature of the landscape is very much uh, a binary opposite to the early farmland. Uh, also, in terms of water, it means that transportation then becomes a question. How do they move the stones and indeed the wood timbers because you haven't necessarily got rivers that you can float them along. Uh, 
I'm not sure whether within your question you are also asking about sort of lines within the landscape i don't mean here ley lines but i'd sort of mean that the way in which because you specifically said not big rivers but sort of the movement of water through the landscape perhaps in little streams um would have had any effect on placing of the monument um i don't think i've not come across any theory that really draws in the presence of water as a key contributor to the location and layout of Stonehenge. But if I've slightly misunderstood your question, please, please do put a clarification in and I'm happy to come back to it. So um, is there any evidence of what tools were used to work the stones at Stonehenge or have any of the tools ever been found? Uh, good question, because we mentioned about the antler picks that were found at Woodhenge. And we certainly know that in the early Neolithic, antler picks were a key material used for working um, soil. We know that lots of them would be found at Grimes Graves, which is a Neolithic flint mine in Norfolk. So antler is a hard material. It's hard enough to break and shape soil. It's not hard enough to break and shape stone. The thing that's hard enough to break and shape stone is another stone. And this is exactly the same conversation that people have around the stone monuments in ancient Egypt, in that it's believed that large stone monuments are principally created through using a harder stone. And what you do is having quarried your stone, you then start to pound and break down the surface to get a rough out shape which is then transported to where the monument is going to be raised. And at that point, there's a greater working of that roughed out shape, again using stones to break away and also abrade the surface to create the eventual shape, Neolithic, that being the, the long oblong shapes which were then raised and put on top. It's very time consuming. I can hear you saying, isn't that a slow way to do it? Yes, it is. It takes a long time. Uh, the other thing that people often ask is, well, if it's the Bronze Age, can't they just use metal? You can use metal on stone. And indeed, we know that metal is used on stone. But what happens is that the hardness of the stone takes the edge off the metal blade very quickly. And you continually have to rework the metal blade so bronze can be used to work stone, but it isn't really any quicker than using another stone because it gets blunted, particularly that, that early forged bronze. The blades go off very quickly when they're being used against a stone surface. So stone is usually used to work stone. Thank you. Um, what would Stonehenge have looked like before it decayed? Would the upturned trees have helped form a roof? Sorry, is that Stonehenge or Seahenge? Seahenge, sorry, that's my mistake. Oh, Seahenge. Oh, you yeah, know, no, the tree at Seahenge is absolutely fascinating. And I like the fact that you've picked up on it being upside down. Um, because what experts think is that um, that idea of the, the upside down root, which then would have meant that the larger areas of the tree root would have, would have stuck up in the ground, uh, almost making a bowl. If anyone's seen a tree that's fallen over in a modern wood, you'll sort of see that the roots almost are around the outside and the centre is often full of very small feeding roots, which then wouldn't survive as part of the monument. It's those strong tap roots that have survived. They think that that upside down tree root might have been deliberately put upside down as um, a commentary on duality and also the world turned upside down and the thought that perhaps the tree was growing down into a, an underworld and that the three parts of the human world, the sky, the land and the underground are somehow turned upside down at Seahenge. So the roots would have been open, there would have been nothing over the top of them because they were demonstrating not only sort of the roots as a bowl for the sky above, but also the fact that being upside down was like ceremonially, ritually turning the world upside down and creating a different journey 
for humans, which instead of going from the ground up to the sky, which is what a tree represents, you have the ground going down to the underworld. So you've turned the tree upside down. And what was invisible, the roots, become visible. And what was visible, the crown and the leaves, the living part that we see, then goes into the underworld, the world of the ancestors, and is not visible. So yeah, really good question. And yes, stone uh, sea hedge is absolutely fascinating. Right, thank you. Um, I don't, is there any more questions? I'll just give you a second or so. If not, we'll tidy up for today. Is any more? Is there? No, I think that's it for today. It was fun, absolutely fantastic. Everybody said they really liked it. So thank you, Catherine. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining me today. And Ooh. I have to say, it's lovely to have an opportunity to talk with you, not just about a single monument or a single object, but to actually start to build up with you um, some sort of wider oh. ideas of the, the human societies and also to pick up some of the things that are a bit counterintuitive. So very often we have the idea that, oh, wood was used before stone, uh, stone is more precious than wood. And then you come to something like sea henge and you actually start to see that once you play around and you put aside those sort of assumptions about the qualities of a material, you then draw in the, the use of the bronze axes because wood, you can work with a bronze axe, can't you? So sea henge is a demonstration that these bronze tools, which couldn't be used in the previous stone uh, age, now you're drawing wood back into human society and making it, it, it then becomes easier to work because of bronze. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a lovely complex story and it's those nuances that I think are, are so fascinating about archeology. span Oh, I've just got one quick question that someone's, someone's turned. Could Woodhenge have been an area of shelter? Oh, are we thinking again about the posts possibly having some sign of, sign of cover? Um, it's, it's an interesting suggestion. It, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that any of those monuments on the Marlborough Downs were linked to any form of permanent settlement so Woodhenge would have been um, a site that you visited but you didn't live and the posts are similar to the holes that are found at Stonehenge where they think that before the, the Stonehenge there was a sort of a Woodhenge at Stonehenge if you see what I mean and those poles would have had no cover to them uh, and it's the idea of sort of the poles marking a spot in the landscape the poles reaching up to the sky and you would not have had a covering on that because you, what you wanted was to be inside that monument with the sky above you. It's very similar to some of the um, early Egyptian temples created by Akhenaten where they actually, they deliberately had no roof so that you had that connection with the sky above. So unlikely to have been any form of permanent settlement or indeed to have had any top across it, although to our eye, it, it looks like they're there to hold something up. They're holding up the cosmos. That's what they're holding up. Thank you, Catherine. And that, uh, so thank you very much for everyone and hope we'll see you next week. Thank you.